So, good day students and uh, welcome to the third nugget in the lesson dealing with biofuels. And today's subject is biochemistry. In the previous nugget I talked about chemical synthesis as a method to make a very complex mixture of fatty oils into a more or less uniform liquid fuel. And I used the word chemistry or chemical synthesis in the meaning that we use specific reactants to promote specific reactions. And maybe also a catalyst to shorten the time to reach an um, equilibrium. It was also understood that the reactions did not necessarily need extreme temperatures or pressures. Today we will talk about chemical reactions that are driven by living organisms. Such processes are extremely complicated because they occur in the living cells. So for this kind of processes what we typically do is to arrange such conditions that will be appreciated by a whole variety of microorganisms. And then we try to avoid such conditions that would attract microorganisms that would produce poisonous compounds or hinder the process. And then we leave these microorganisms to do their job and we simply harvest what they produce. And that is exactly the advantage with the biochemical roots. From the videos about fame production in the previous nugget, you will remember that you had to set a correct temperature and weigh a specific amount of catalyst and measure an exact amount of methanol and such. Biological systems are a bit more adaptable. Just look at us, the mammal called Homo sapiens. We are spread all over the planet, from sea level to the high mountains in Nepal and Chile, from the Kalahari Desert to Greenland. There are limits, but within these, these limits we will adapt. And the same thing holds true for the microorganisms. There are limits to their living conditions, but as long as we stay within these limits will the organisms live quite happily. The processes will to some extent be self-regulating. So as long as we accept that the yield from our processes is not always maximized, will there be an option for a relatively simple control of the biochemical processes. And then the second price we have to pay is that the primary products will be anything but pure. The feedstock to the biochemical processes is called the substrate. The substrate is actually the food for the microorganisms. And since we do not want to poison the microorganisms, will the substrate have to be clear of toxic substances? If the substrate and the process are properly managed, may the residual product well be recycled into agriculture. But you will have to be aware of any pathogens that might occur. And then, just because the microorganisms are living matter, may the substrate be very wet. 95% water content, like sewage sludge or wet algae, is not a problem for the process. It may, though, be a logistic problem due to pump power requirements and things like that. But then, of course, there are also disadvantages. Some of the microorganisms doing the work may produce toxic substances. In such cases, must the residues be hygienized or sterilized before use? And there is also a risk for bad smell around the facility. And there might be other problems of a sanitary nature. After all, what biochemical conversion is about is to invite decomposer organisms for dinner. The food served is the biomass we want to convert. And what we want the decomposer organisms to do for us is to produce an energy-rich side product. Today are these side products mainly alcohol or methane. But maybe will process development give rise to new processes? But again, what the processes are about is decomposing of easily digestible biomass. And also other animals like rats or plants like rot fungi 
or worms or might also want to join in for dinner. And if they are allowed, then there will be sanitary problems. So the facility will have to be properly supervised to fence off any of these unwanted guests. But given that, are the biochemical conversion routes relatively simple to manage? So let us have a look at what can be produced by biochemical conversion. In the previous nugget, we were talking about FAME or biodiesel and HVO. These were both light fuel oil substitutes that could also be used in car engines, but so can ethanol. The difference is that ethanol mixes nicely with gasoline and is therefore not used in diesel engines. Ethanol is already an in-mix in gasoline in most countries. Typically, are 5 to 10 percent of the gasoline you get from the pump and fill into your car ethanol. The global production of ethanol is actually more than double that of biodiesel. What this diagram shows is the total production of liquid biofuel worldwide. And as you see, is the dark green bioethanol dominant with about 85 million cubic meters produced in 2017. Second place is held by FAME or biodiesel, about 36 million cubic meters in 2017. And on top in the diagram, the light green is HVO, ethanol from lignocellulose, and slightly more odd biofuels. So bioethanol is one major product and it is produced through a biochemical process. The diagram in this slide originates from the same source and shows the total energy supplied from biogas, again worldwide. The scale is million, million, million joule or exajoule. The total volume represented in the diagram is about 61,600 million cubic meters. That is about 9 cubic meters per person and year worldwide. The total energy is almost what is used in Sweden. So biogas is another major product. And again it is produced through a biochemical conversion process. You may remember from the last nugget in the first lesson that one important factor for biomass to be easily de degradable was the absence of a rigid cell wall. The problem with the rigid cell wall was that the main polymer, lignin, is very difficult for the decomposition organisms. And also cellulose is a very tough substance for these organisms. So what they want to have are soft cells with only cell membranes. Zoo biomass is fine, and in general marine biomass. And then the decomposition organisms are living matter, so they need water. For ethanol production will the process stop once the alcohol concentration reaches 15 to 20 percent by volume. So what you want to have is sugar dissolved in water in such a concentration that once all the sugar is converted is the alcohol concentration at the most about 15%. For biogas production is a practical lower limit about 60% water content. Biochemical processes are the only alternative to make energetic use of such wet things as these sludges and water solutions that I just mentioned. But then there has to be a proper substrate for the microorganisms to eat in that water slurry. For ethanol fermentation you will want to use yeast fungi. And they will be happy to work with sugars that have six carbon atoms in the molecule. For anaerobic digestion, you will typically use a microorganism culture that has a variety of organisms. There will be a lot of fungi and maybe also some bacteria of different kinds. They will, altogether, not be as strict when it comes to their diet as the yeast fungi are. 
So most sugars, fats, carbohydrates and proteins will work fine. What you may find is that some lipids may need a heat treatment to increase the rate of digestion. And then, of course, will you have to provide the proper living conditions for the microorganisms. As said in the previous slide, will fermentation cease once the ethanol concentration becomes too high? The exact level of concentration will depend on the type of yeast, but in general, Will the fermentation product be some 80% water and only 20% or less ethanol? This cannot be used for fuel. So the product must be concentrated. The traditional method is by distillation. That is to use heat to evaporate the ethanol and then condense it again. The problem is that this is an expensive process. As for biogas, is the actual methane content at the reactor outlet depending on the substrate. But generally it is no higher than 65% and sometimes as low as 50% methane. The second biggest amount of gas will be carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide is a result of the microorganism respiration. And there will also be corrosive gases. Since the digestion is anaerobic, so it is oxygen-free, will sulfur form hydrogen sulfide? For the same reason will chlorine form hydrogen chloride. And there will be other corrosive and poisonous gases. So again, will the primary product need to be improved? The paper by Ave at Ally has not been published in a scientific paper, but when I look at it, it seems to give a correct description of the main routes and technologies. You will find links to both these papers in the link list to this nugget. In the homework session, you will read about the production processes in some more detail. But before you go on to that, I would advise you to scan through a number of chapters in the Biziplan Handbook. First scan section 1 in chapter 4.0. Then go through chapters 1, 3, 2, 3 and 4, 3 according to the instructions in this slide. Once you have done that, you will have the first idea about anaerobic digestion. As for ethanol production, this is a mature technology, already used in large scale worldwide. You will learn a bit about the processes in the homework session, but right now I would say that you need only what you can find in the rest chains self-training material. So go to the rest chains material and select fermentable sludge as a resource and then read about the different options. While there you might also want to have a look at the digestible sludge as a resource. After that Read through the two papers I recommended in the previous slide, and they will give you an idea of the post-processing processes. Once you've done this reading, you will be well prepared to take on the homework.